Thank you very much. I want to welcome you to this important um, section where we are going to deliberate and make a review of the ISO 15189 2022, which is an update of the ISO 15189 2012. So today I have um, my presenter, um, MLS John Van Grace to take us through what is it in the new ISO um, in order to help uh, professionals understand what it, the demands are and um, get to know the way forward in applying this new standard. So, Mr. John Van Grace, I want you to give us an overview of the, um, the new ISO in town. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to be on this discussion. Now, this new uh, document, which was revised over a period of about two years and released just this month, the key changes are that they have merged another ISO standard that was focused on the point of care testing. So there was a standard that regulated or helped laboratories or clinics to make sure they were following quality standard and having, having competent personnel performing tests using the point of care. But now with this new ISO 15189 2022 edition, they have incorporated that standard into this new one. Therefore, they have uh, withdrawn that ISO, that 870, 2016 edition. That's for point of care testing. So, 22870. Yeah, the 2016 edition. Okay. As a result of the release of this new one, which is ISO 15189 2022. This one has been redrawn, so it's no more valid. So going forward, uh, all laboratories who are using this ISO are expected to get acquainted with this new uh, ISO document. Another thing too is that it was focused on the patient and more clinically oriented. So I think as we go further, we'll look at those key updates. Thank you so much. So I want to know when we talk about review and ISO, how is it done and what are the requirements? How is the new ISO prepared? The ISO organization, they have various technical committees. Uh, remember, the ISO is not uh, mainly for only medical laboratories. They have for the organization, they have for the food industry, they have for logistic industry, they have for various areas. So they have different, different technical committees. So when they wanted to prepare or revise this ISO, that's the ISO 15189 20, uh, 2012. When they wanted to revise it, they set up a committee. That's a technical committee, ISO stroke TC212. And they, they are for clinical laboratory testing and in vitro diagnostic test system. Now, this committee worked with the European Committee for Standardization, technical committee 140. They also go into in vitro diagnostic medical services in accordance with agreement on technical cooperation between ISO and the, the European Committee for Standardization. And this was mainly because they were now incorporating the point of care testing uh, devices and its test uh, its operation into the 15189. So this group of people sat down, then they drafted the first document. 
and the first document was circulated around the world to various ISO accredit accrediting bodies. So it went to Germany, it went to US, it went to Nigeria, it went to Egypt, it went to South Africa, major countries went to Brazil. Then they were asked to comment on the changes they were going to make. So around the world, all these various accrediting bodies made changes. So from South Africa, SANAS, that's the South African National Accreditation uh, Board, they also made comments. US made comments. Now the comments were both technical and grammatical. Grammatical because when we did our presentation on the ISO 9001 9, recently, I made mention of what uh, some words meant. If they say shall, what it means. If they say should, what it means. If they say can, what it means. So both the technical and the grammatical areas were being looked at. And these people made changes and sent it back to the technical committee. Now, what the technical committee does is they go through all those comments, then take those that are uh, relevant or that are necessary to apply. When they do that, then they send it back to all those uh, accrediting bodies again to see the changes they have made. If they are all okay, that's when they now make a final draft and circulate it to them to see uh, whether the implementation will be smooth. When they all agree that it will be okay, then it is made into a document and published. When it's published, the, it immediately cancels the current version and makes the new uh, publication the relevant one to be used. The only thing is you don't immediately, it doesn't immediately uh, cancel the accreditation people have had. So if people are on the IS 189 2012, it's all those who are on the old one to change into the new one. So these are the things that get involved in the preparation of a new ISO that's revising a new ISO standard. Thank you so much. I think the, you've nailed it. You've given us all the details from the starting of the review process to when uh, it's completed. Now, starting, you made mention of some of the uh, changes or the updates uh, in the new ISO 15189 2022. I want to be more specific. Uh, you made mention of POCT inclusion. So I want to be more specific, I want to I want us to know some of the key changes or updates that we should be expecting in the or we, we are seeing in the ISO 151892. Okay, now the, some of the key updates include a greater focus on clinical risk and the impact of services on patients. That's one, a greater focus on clinical risk, the impact of services on patients. Then the, as I, shared, I, I said earlier, the incorporation of the requirements of ISO 22870, the 2012, 2016 edition, points of care testing, requirements for quality and competence has now been added. Then the third key update is a structural reorganization to bring the standard in line with the 17,000 series standards. Now the 17,000 series standards, these are a standard that relate to themes of certification and accreditation. They are the mother standard of ISO 15189. So they've made this new one to be in line with that 17,000 series standard. At first, it was not totally in line. It was uh, juggling between the 9,001 and the one that was focused on uh, calibration and testing. So they've now brought it in line with the 17,000 series standard. 
So when you look at the new eyes, you see that they change some arrangements, how leadership is supposed to be, the, the laboratory director, and the training of the personnel, because they are now adding the point of care. Some things have changed to make it uh, more fluid. This new ISO comes with its flexibility. The older one was somehow rigid. If you don't uh, satisfy this requirement, it is no, uh, considered as non-conformance. But this time around, because the focus is on clinical risk and what the quality of service we are giving to patients, you should be able to uh, have evidence why you are doing what you are doing. And it should be clinically accepted across the world. So if it is a, a new something you are doing, you should be able to have evidence supporting that. And that should also meet the standard or the requirements in the standard so that whoever is doing the audit, when assessors come, they will understand that, okay, this is why you are doing what you are doing. At first, if you don't go in line with the document they have, the details they have in their document, they will not agree and they will give you non-conformance and ask you to go according to what they have. So there's some kind of flexibility in this new edition. And it is also less prescriptive. The older one, that's 2012 edition, was prescribing what you should do. However, this one is, as I said, more flexible. So you should have evidence to how you are meeting the requirement in the standard. So I'm because trying that, to get along. So what it means is that in the new standard, they've tried to give room for laboratories and professionals to, um, as it were, do things on their own, but they should have a proof to convince the um, the standard that they, they are meeting um, the standard, but they have that flu uh, fluidity to come out with their own concept, but they should have a proof at the end of the day. Yes. If you have, so let's say, for instance, uh, if here you know that uh, running three controls in your laboratory is, is a cost burden to the organization or to the hospital, you should document how you came at the conclusion of using two controls out of the three levels. And satisfy, have documents that show that, that's records that show that using two controls are also satisfactory in ensuring that there's quality assurance in the results that you are delivering. So that's some kind of uh, example, because at first, some of them, there are some particular tests, they will not agree if you use only two controls out of three. But if you have scientific understanding or scientific uh, reasoning to why you are doing what you are doing. There is a published, there are published papers to support what you are saying. You show it to them with this new standard, they will come to a conclusion and ensure that you also keep following what is going on in that area so that when there are changes to what you got from the published paper, you can also change. So there's this flexibility in making innovation there should be some kind of innovation in the lab, not copying what we have from one environment, one region. So taking something from North America and trying to apply it here in West Africa, there will be some challenges. For, because, for instance, we had a machine some time ago, and just because of the sea level we have in Ghana, compared to the sea level in South Africa, there was one test, every EQA we did, we were out of order. So through investigation, I realized there was a setting in the machine that the engineer had to change to suit our environment. So we had to document it down that, okay, originally the machine came with this sea level in it, and we changed it to the sea level in Ghana. And when we did that, the next EQA we passed. 
So we had a document done to show why we moved from this sea level to that sea level. So all what we are talking about is you should have evidence, documented evidence to whatever changes you are making. And they should be clinically sound. So now this time around, uh, whatever the decision you are taking in the lab should have physicians involved. So if the physicians say, okay, this is how we want our test. Maybe in FBC, in all our FBC, you, we don't need blah, blah, blah. There should be documents supporting what they have said. That they don't need this in their FBC or in their renal function test. They need the EGFR. They need the ion gap because these are calculated figures. So you should have evidence supporting all these clinical decisions or clinical uh, recommendations so that when you are trying to apply them in the lab uh, setting, you will not have challenges when the assessors come to find out, okay, why are you going away from what we know generally? That maybe when you say electrolytes, we have sodium, magnesium, electrolyte, air, chloride, bicarbonate. No, outside Ghana, magnesium phosphate is part of the electrolyte, but we don't have. So there should be reasons why we don't have that in our set of electrolytes, why we have it separately. So all these things give room for professionals to get acquainted. That is well elucidated. Now we know what is in it. So going forward, I want to know um, what next, what is in, um, in it for the uh, testing labs? What is it in it for the patient? What is it in it for um, an auditor, um, an investigator in the ISO accreditation process? And for the patient, I think you will um, clarify what is in it for them. And I want yeah. to, I want you to elaborate more on what is it in it going forward uh, after the publication of this ISO. What is it that um, we as professionals uh, for testing labs, what is expected of them? Okay, so uh, if you will remember in our presentation on the ISO integrated system. We, in one of the, the lectures, we talked about REX assessment. Now, this new standard is also focused on such. So we have to now do most of our things based on REX assessment. We should be proactive instead of reactive. We should uh, look at at our workflow, where do we see possible risks, possible challenges, and bring them up? Now, if you are not accredited, this information is to help you refine the way you work or you do things in your lab. So all what we are doing in this presentation is to help us all come to a level where our results will be more reliable. So you should be able to identify risks that will cause issues in your operation. Then you have room for solving those risks. Either you uh, mitigate them, you monitor them, or you take it, you take them out totally. You now the other thing to, as I said, is flexibility to allow for clinical, clinical just justifiable variation to the standard. So whatever you want to do, changes you want to make as a lab, you are now with this new standard, you have the opportunity to do it. So you do it with evidence, well uh, preserved, so that when they come, you'll be able to give them that evidence to support the changes. So the first thing any lab can do with the introduction, especially those who are accredited with the ISO 15189312, is to perform gap analysis. They review their local quality management system 
against the requirements of this new uh, standard. So the gap analysis will help them to involve input from the laboratory staff, the clinical staff. So if you are in a hospital, you have a greater opportunity. If you are in lab, a stand and low lab, you also have an opportunity to liaise with your uh, hospitals or clinics you are working with. So support or input from them will help you prepare to make changes uh, according, to, according to this new standard. Now, especially for those already accredited, with the publication of the 2022 standard for 15189, within the next three years, they are all supposed to transit from the 2012th to 2022. So from the day it was published until 2025 December, all those accredited are supposed to be reassessed and given this new accreditation. So they will be in the next uh, assessment they will have it will be against this new standard. So if yours is getting closer, you have to liaise with your accrediting body to know when they would like to uh, audit you based on this new accreditation, this new standard. So those are the new or the next steps any laboratory has to take as a result of the publication of this new ISO. Now, another an interesting thing that came with this ISO is that it gives us now a wider application. It's not limited to only medical laboratory. The same standard can be used for diagnostic imaging, for physiological sciences, for blood bank and transfusion services. So if for instance, our National Blood Bank uh, in Kolebu wants to get accredited. Now it's possible. They, with this new standard, they can do that. If a, a blood bank in a laboratory, in a hospital wants to get accredited, it can do that. Because accreditation can be done for a particular area in a laboratory. So you do it step by step. So if with this new one, you, you mostly use points of care uh, machines. A test, a testing instrument that are mostly points of care, and you want to raise the standard of your service, this is an opportunity for you to be accredited with this new standard. All right, thank you so much. So this is a good update for all of us. And looking at the opportunities in it, I believe that we are going to take advantage of it and help us expand our scope of practice. Now, yeah. well, let me leave you, but if you have closing remarks um, regards to the presentations that you just made, um, we can conclude with that. Okay. Now, what I want to pass across is with this new document, it gives us an opportunity or it should rather inspire most of our laboratories to go in that direction. Even not getting accredited, we should learn the system in this document and apply it in our system. And with that way, we'll have much confidence in the results we turn out to our physicians, clinic, and individual uh, individuals. So the document, this new document is applicable to medical laboratories in developing their management systems and addressing their competence. It's also for confirming or recognizing the competence of medical laboratories by the laboratory users, regulating bodies, and accrediting bodies. So that's the application of this new document. I think this will summarize all what we have said so far. Thank you so much, Mr. John Van Grace, for Thank this you. opportunity to have this vital discussion with you. Without further um, 
issues in the coming days. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for the privilege also. Thank you. Greetings to all our listeners. Amen. Thank you so much for joining today's section. We look forward to come to you with uh, equally important topics and discussions. I'm your moderator, Ivan Shreme. Kindly do subscribe to our channel so that you receive updates from us. Thank you so much.